An idea is only as strong as the people who share it. Throughout its history, the European Union, the ideal of Europeans living and working together in peace and prosperity, has been advanced by remarkable people who gave more than was expected. Founded as the Irish Council of the European Movement in the Shelburne Hotel in January 1954, the European Movement Ireland is an independent, not-for-profit, membership-based organisation working to develop the connection between Ireland and Europe. Since 1988, when Peter Sutherland was named our inaugural European of the Year, the award, our highest honour, has recognised those who have made outstanding contribution to promoting and enhancing Ireland's place in the EU. The title of European of the Year has been awarded to a distinguished list of Irish individuals with backgrounds in art, business, politics and administration. These include former Tishi, members of the Irish Defence Forces, the playwright Brian Friel, former Secretary General of the European Commission Catherine Day and the late John Hume. Our founders believed in recognising the role of people in shaping a better future for the European Union and Ireland's place within it. Today, we believe that more than ever. Michel Barnier took the time and energy to understand Ireland, our unique position, our history, our relationship with the EU. He has gained the trust and respect of the Irish people. He is our European of the Year. An idea is only as strong as the people who share it. Throughout its history, the European Union, the ideal of Europeans living and working together in peace and prosperity, has been advanced by remarkable people who gave more than was expected. Founded as the Irish Council of the European Movement in the Shelburne Hotel in January 1954, the European Movement Ireland is an independent, not-for-profit, membership-based organisation working to develop the connection between Ireland and Europe. Since 1988, when Peter Sutherland was named our inaugural European of the Year, the award, our highest honour, has recognised those who have made outstanding contribution to promoting and enhancing Ireland's place in the EU. The title of European of the Year has been awarded to a distinguished list of Irish individuals with backgrounds in art, business, politics and administration. These include former Tishi, members of the Irish Defence Forces, the playwright Brian Friel, former Secretary General of the European Commission Catherine Day and the late John Hume. Our founders believed in recognising the role of people in shaping a better future for the European Union and Ireland's place within it. Today, we believe that more than ever. Michel Barnier took the time and energy to understand Ireland, our unique position, our history, our relationship with the EU. He has gained the trust and respect of the Irish people. He is our European of the Year. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Cade Mila Falchero of Accordia Galair is Murguing Shivaven Ardianta on Sharalina Don Ochod on a special show. Distinguished guests, a very warm welcome to all of you joining us across Europe and indeed further afield to all our friends as far away as the United States for today's very special occasion, 
That is European Movement Ireland's European of the Year Award Ceremony. My name is Noel O'Connell and I'm the CEO of EM Ireland, whilst also being the MC for today's event. Now sadly, instead of being physically together in Dublin, as is tradition for a special occasion such as this, unfortunately, circumstances that we all know and appreciate have led to this European of the Year gathering moving online to the virtual world. And to that end, we are coming to you live today from both Dublin and Brussels for our European of the Year award ceremony, an award that recognises, as it does, individuals and organisations that have made outstanding contributions to furthering the connections and relationship between Ireland and Europe. Our inaugural award was presented to the late Peter Sutherland back in 1988. And continuing in that tradition since then, this event remains a very special one for all of us at European Movement Ireland. And despite having had to postpone the ceremony a few times, due to Brexit circumstances outside all of our control, we finally, today, have the opportunity to bestow this award to the EU's Head of Task Force for Relations with the UK and our European of the Year, Mr. Michel Barnier. Michel is joining us live today from the Berlimont in Brussels. Bonjour, Mr. Barnier. Bonjour, Michel. Good morning to all of you. The Good Eve. morning. <laughs> it is lovely to see you. Thank you, thank you, Michelle, and I'm very much looking forward to your address uh, later on and our Q&A. And our European of the Year Award is the highest honour that European Movement Ireland bestows with previous winners, including former Tishi, the Irish Defence Forces, those in arts, sports, literature, politics, administration, philanthropy, charity and human rights. And in that regard, we must also pay tribute to another European of the Year awardee, whom I know, Michel Barnier, is one he would have worked with in the past, the late John Hume. As we commemorate what would have been John Hume's 84th birthday earlier this week, John was a proud dairyman, a great Irishman, and a committed European. In his own words, let us not forget that the EU is the best example, as we have learned, of conflict resolution. John was a passionate believer of European integration and positive UK-Irish relations being mutually reinforcing. Sentiments we hope will and we commit to endeavouring to guide our way forward in the time ahead. Returning to the business at hand, the running order for today's event We'll see contributions from Minister of State for European Affairs, Thomas Byrne TD, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Defence, Simon Coveney TD, and our Prime Minister, our Taoiseach, Michal Martin TD. They will then be followed by EM Ireland Chairman, Maurice Pratt, who will deliver European Movement Ireland's award citation address for Michel Barnier. After Morris's remarks, we will then cross over live to Brussels, where our European of the Year honoree, Michel Barnier, will deliver his keynote award acceptance address. After which time, I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to engage in a conversation with Michel and pose some questions that have been submitted. We are currently live across all the various social media platforms, and for those of you active on social media, please do feel free to engage in this event using the hashtag European of the Year and tagging at EM Ireland. As many of you know, at EM Ireland, we work to develop, to strengthen the connections and the engagement between Ireland and Europe. Now, this is the first time we have presented our European of the Year award to somebody who isn't an Irish citizen. By promoting this greater engagement, this connection amongst the countries, amongst the peoples of Europe. This is something that Mr. Barnier has pursued with great distinction, with great determination throughout his distinguished career. 
He has never wavered from his commitment to safeguarding, to protecting and to upholding the integrity and the values of the European Union and indeed Ireland's place in it. Mr Barnier has continued the proud legacy of so many of his compatriots who have dedicated their careers to promoting the ideals of European integration and helping to shape the Europe that we know today. And here we pay tribute to another notable Frenchman in this field, the late Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. During his tenure as President of France, in a Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly address, he said, Les progrès de l'Europe n'ont donné à aucun des pays qui composent la communauté le sentiment d'avoir perdu son identité ou aliéné sa souveraineté. En progressant, nous ne nous sommes pas défaits nous-mêmes, nous nous sommes rencontrés. Certainly, is our score Kayla of our Nagwini. That progress of Europe has not given any of the countries which make up the community the feeling of having lost their identity or their sovereignty. As we have progressed, we have not diminished ourselves, but rather we have met one another. And in the spirit of continuing to meet one another, despite the current challenges facing Europe and the world around us, it is now time to hear from Antishuk Michal Martin, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence, Simon Coveney, and the Minister for European Affairs, Thomas Byrne, who gathered to pay tribute to Michel Barnier for this special award. Dear Michel, as Taoiseach, uh, as Honorary President of the European Movement of Ireland, and on my own behalf, I am delighted to convey warmest congratulations to you on the occasion of your recognition as European of the Year 2020. Over the past four years, you have come to represent for so many of us here in Ireland all that is best about the European Union. Like so many other leaders across Europe, I continue to admire the resourcefulness, determination, integrity and composure which have become the hallmarks of your approach to the Brexit negotiations throughout. And over the past four years, a very particular bond has been formed between you and people in Ireland. That you are so well known in Ireland is a reflection of the fact that from the beginning you spared no effort to understand the unique and disproportionate challenges facing our island in the context of Brexit. You worked tirelessly to find ways to protect what matters most, whilst being open always about the fact that Brexit means fundamental change. Your consistent, fair and to borrow one of your own favourite words, de-dramatised approach made agreement possible on these issues. I recall the memorable, memorable joint sitting of members of the Doyle and the Shannon, which you addressed in May 2017. This was in keeping with your close and continuous engagements in Dublin, Belfast, Brussels, and on visits to the border with political leaders and with business and community representatives north and south. Throughout, you saw clearly the need to protect the Good Friday Agreement avoid a hard border on this island and to protect the integrity of the single market and Ireland's place in it. Through all of this, as our chief negotiator, you became for many the face and embodiment of European solidarity. You can also be credited with ensuring the wider united cohesive approach of the European Union 27 throughout the Brexit process, including during its most critical moments. The universal confidence and respect you continue to inspire in European Union capitals is testament to your efforts. I know, Michelle, that you're a long-time committed and long-standing supporter of the European project. You served twice with distinction as a European Commissioner and came to know Ireland well in both those roles, as, of course, when you were Foreign Minister uh, during an Irish European Union Presidency, as well as French Minister for Agriculture, where your savoir heritage was clear in the deep appreciation you have for the well-being and prosperity of rural communities. In all of this, a friendship has been cemented between you and Ireland. I look forward, when circumstances allow, to welcome you back to Ireland, and perhaps on that occasion you will have the opportunity to retrace the visit of General Charles de Gaulle, as I know you would like, to visit Connemara and Kerry, and to that list, I would add, to visit Cork. Michelle, 
As Minister for Foreign Affairs, I'm delighted to congratulate you on your recognition as the 2020 European of the Year from European Movement Ireland. I can't think of anyone who's more deserving of this title. I had the privilege of working closely with you from the very start of the Brexit negotiations, and you have never faltered. Throughout our regular meetings in Brussels, in Dublin and beyond, I've been struck not only by how effectively and persuasively you've represented the EU's interests and values, but also by the enormous effort you've made to understand the specific issues affecting our island. You've done this with fairness and commanding attention to detail. In the most challenging of moments, you protected the interests and issues of utmost importance and you've always been receptive to our positions and our concerns while maintaining solidarity and unity across the EU27 and in the European Parliament. Not an easy feat. This award recognises more than anything that you represent the European values of democracy, of equality, the rule of law and human rights. And you do so with consistency and calm authority. Michelle has asked me for one thing when this is all over, a quiet and peaceful fishing trip in the west of Ireland. I can assure you that is guaranteed. Congratulations on the award and thank you from everybody in Ireland. Monsieur Barnier, j'ai le grand plaisir de vous féliciter pour avoir reçu ce prix pour Européen de l'année. Much has been made of your contributions to the European Union's unity, solidarity and clarity during a challenging four years of Brexit negotiations. I would like to take this chance to add my own words of thanks to the much-deserved chorus of plaudits. While there will rightly be much focus on your strong stewardship of the Brexit negotiations and the achievement of a trade and cooperation agreement with the UK, your contribution to Europe goes much deeper. Your roles as Commissioner for Regional Policy and Commissioner for Internal Market and Services, together with your terms as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of State for European Affairs and Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries, speak for themselves. Undoubtedly, this wealth of experience has stood you in good stead in the face of the huge and wide-ranging change that Brexit brings. Your unwavering commitment to ensuring that the principles of the European Union and the interests of its member states, not least of all Ireland's, are protected, has been crystal clear at every juncture during this process. Above all, your recognition that the European Union has always been at its heart a project of peace was demonstrated in your deep personal commitment to ensuring that the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland were recognised and the achievements of the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement were protected. Harchian Winterna Heron, Gormagut, August Cogardis. Thank you, Minister Coveney, Minister Byrne, and Tishuk Michal Martin, for those excellent contributions and indeed justifiable words of tribute to our European of the Year awardee, Michel Barnier. It's fair to say recognising that special bond that exists between Michel Barnier and the people of Ireland, as the Taoiseach remarked. So many good wishes are coming in for you, Michel Barnier, and including good wishes and congratulations from Commissioner Mairead McGuinness, amongst many others. I'm afraid we don't have the time today to read them all out, otherwise we'd never get the opportunity to present this award to you. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, for today's ceremony, Maurice Pratt, the Chairman of European Movement Ireland. Maurice will deliver our European of the Year Award citation address, where he will highlight some of the many, many reasons underpinning the bestowing of EM Ireland's highest honour, the European of the Year Award, to a very worthy and deserving recipient, Michel Barnier. Maurice, over to you. Thanks, Noel. I would also like to thank Antishuk and Honorary President of European Movement Ireland, Michal Martin TD, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Defence, Simon Coveney TD, and the Minister for State for European Affairs, Thomas Byrne TD, for their contributions. We very much appreciate your sentiments. And welcome, Michelle. It's a great honour and pleasure to have you with us here today. 
I remember well meeting you in the Berlimont when we presented our European movement Ireland, Brexit A to Z to you. That seems like a lifetime ago at this stage, given everything that has happened since. I would like to also welcome our distinguished guests and friends who join us from Ireland, Brussels, across Europe and beyond. In more normal circumstances, we would have held this award event in the usual way. However, one benefit of this virtual ceremony is that so many of you can join us from wherever you happen to be today. We've had an amazing level of interest in the event, which is a tribute to our honoree, Michel Barnier. My name is Maurice Pratt, and I am the chairman of European Movement Ireland. Many of you will be familiar with our work as the longest established voluntary not-for-profit membership organisation working on European affairs in Ireland. Our mission today is the same as it was in January 1954, the year we were founded by visionaries, whose goal was to engage with our members and our stakeholders to develop the connection between Ireland and Europe and to achieve greater public understanding of and engagement with the European Union and our European partners. I am confident in saying this is a mission we share with Michel Barnier, a man who has spent his life working to strengthen the connections between people across Europe and engaging with those from different backgrounds with a view to promoting understanding and engendering trust. Since Michel was appointed to lead the negotiations on the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union and the subsequent negotiations on the future EU-UK relationship, it's fair to say that an unprecedented level of understanding has developed between him and the Irish people. He has earned our universal respect and the trust of the 27 member states of the European Union to negotiate on all our behalf. This was at the core of European unity displayed throughout the negotiations led by him and all his European Commission team and colleagues. As you will know by now, we in Ireland are open. We like to talk things through. We're optimistic and outward looking natural bridge builders and friend makers. Cooperation is our preferred way of doing business. We were disappointed by what happened in the UK in June 2016. When the British people voted to leave the EU, we recognised we would be losing a friend and ally inside the European Union, whom we worked together with on many issues over the years. Indeed, we both joined the then European Economic Community at the same time. We knew the UK leaving would change Ireland's future in Europe, but we were also clear in our understanding that our future is in Europe. What we did not know and what we were most concerned about is how Brexit would impact peace on this island. Peace that came about because of the painstaking efforts and sacrifices of so many people on both sides. We wondered if the European Union would understand the sensitivities involved. We hoped the decades of progress would not be put at risk. We wanted, and still want, to protect peace while remaining a proud and committed member of the European Union. Michel Barnier understood that. Ireland's interest will be the Union's interest, he said. But we should not have been surprised because peace in Ireland has always aligned with European values. Nobody knows this better than Michel, who was Commissioner for Regional Policy, presided over the peace programme in Northern Ireland as a key support to the Good Friday Peace Agreement. As he put it himself, European integration helped to remove borders that once existed on maps and in mines. We have a word to describe a person, or a particular type of person, a doer, a person who gets things done. Michel Barnier is such a person. He approaches issues and challenges in a calm, methodical, meticulous way. Fair and determined, he has pursued an agreement with the United Kingdom in a way a hiker might approach the summit of a mountain. Born in the Alps region of Savoy, he retains a passion for hiking and draws comparisons between a long hike and a long negotiation, previously telling a group of reporters, if you like walking in the mountains, you have to learn some rules. You have to put one foot in front of the other because sometimes it is a steep and a rocky path. You also have to look for what accidents might befall you. You have to keep your breath and you have to keep looking at the summit. That seems like a good approach to life and it has stood Michel Barnier in good stead. Elected to the French National Assembly in 1978, 
Michel Barnier went on to serve as Minister for the Environment, European Affairs, Foreign Affairs and Agriculture in French governments throughout the 1990s and 2000s. He served a term as European Commissioner for Regional Policy and was elected to the European Parliament before returning to the Commission to take on the Internal Market and Services Brief. He is a passionate believer and advocate for the European project, but never takes it for granted, believing that Europe has to prove its vitality every day. His most recent and arguably greatest challenge has been to negotiate a future trading relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Over a long and difficult period, Michel Barnier sought to protect and advance European interests and values, alongside the ambition to have a close and productive relationship with the United Kingdom. The agreement which has been reached is an extremely positive development. While issues clearly remain, it has provided clarity to businesses and to citizens. Also, and importantly, this agreement can be built upon with a view to ensuring the EU and the UK have an ongoing, constructive and mutually beneficial relationship in the future. And we at European Movement Ireland believe that a strong future relationship is in the best interests of both sides. Ireland, as a proud EU member state with the closest relationship to the UK, has a role to play as a future facilitator in that process. Michelle, I know that the great General de Gaulle inspired you to first enter politics. As recently as November, you again sought inspiration by visiting his office at the former headquarters of the Free French at Carlton Gardens in London when you were there for a negotiating round. In Ireland, we also have an affinity for the General who visited Kerry and Connemara back in 1969 following his retirement. I know that is a journey you are keen to retrace someday soon and I'm sure you will. The way you've pursued an agreement with the United Kingdom has demonstrated the best of European solidarity, fairness and understanding. It was de Gaulle who in 1955 spoke about politics being acting for an ideal through realities. Michel, the way you have faced reality and conducted the business of negotiating on behalf of the 27 member states has undoubtedly made a significant contribution to the European ideal, which is held in the face of Brexit. In doing so, you have contributed to the strengthening of, con of connections between Ireland and the European Union, connections that will endure and prosper for many years to come. It is for these reasons we thank you. We pay tribute to you today and present you with European Movement Ireland's award as our very deserved European of the Year. And I now hand you back to Noel to do the honours. Thank you, Morris, for those words, which I know certainly speak for all of us here in European Movement Ireland, and I have no doubt those watching online. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great honour to present Mr. Michel Barnier with European Movement Ireland's European of the Year Award designed by Waterford Crystal. Michel, sincerest congratulations to you. I would now like to invite you to deliver your European of the Year Award acceptance address. The virtual floor is yours. Good morning, Diaïve. Uh, Good morning to all of you online, um, and thank you very much. Let me start by thanking European Movement Ireland, its chairperson, Maurice Pratt, and uh, you, Noel, for the kind words of introduction. Let me also thank very sincerely Mirol, Simon, and Thomas for their very kind words. Uh, for many years already, you, your organization has played an important role, a key role in stimulating the debate on the EU here in Ireland, communicating on the benefits of Ireland's EU membership, as well as on the implication of Brexit for Ireland and also for the rest of Europe. In today's complex, uh, very complex, and sometimes confusing world where untruths are often presented as facts. The work that you do, you, your team, providing factual and accessible information and engaging actively, very actively, with citizens, businesses, and government administrations has never been more important. It is uh, truly an honor 
to receive Euro European of the Year award, this award. Uh, and it means even more to me, knowing that I am the first non-Irish person to receive it, even though I feel personally a little bit Irish. Ladies and gentlemen, to be or not to be European, or more precisely, to be or not to be in the European Union. That is certainly a question that divided the UK for many years, many years, and most probably will continue to do so in years to come. As for my personal choice, it was made many years ago in 1972, when uh, age 21, I cast my very first ever vote. It was at the occasion of the French referendum and the accession of the UK, Ireland, Denmark, and also Norway to the European communities. And at that time, I campaigned with conviction for their accession, for your accession too. I voted yes, convinced that the European project would be stronger when we are together and that everyone would benefit greatly. To this day, I continue to think that I made at that time the right choice for two main reasons. Firstly, because whether the UK is an EU member or not, our paths are and will always be interlinked. The UK is your and our closest neighbor, our long-standing ally and friend. And as I've said before, never will I forget, never, what the UK did for France and for Europe during the Second World War, never. And as Ursula von der Leyen has said, the bonds between us are unbreakable, ever, even after Brexit. No, nowhere are these bonds more visible than on the island of Ireland. Here, the EU and the UK share the only land border. Here, many citizens have British and Irish nationalities. They can travel freely between Ireland and the UK. In fact, in normal times, some 20 to 30,000 people commute across the invisible border on a daily basis to work. But here too, in your country, the Brexit negotiations were not just about cross-border trade, goods, or the economy. They were more existentially about maintaining peace and stability after decades of conflict. That is why throughout the negotiations, my team and I were particularly attentive, particularly attentive to the concerns voiced by the, all the different parties and communities of Ireland and Northern Ireland. While the sanitary conditions still allowed for it, we traveled several times to Ireland and Northern Ireland. We went to the border. We walked on the Peace Bridge on Derry and London Derry. Above all, we listen, we listen, and to engage with students, women, workers, businesses, owners, and rural communities, because Brexit is first and foremost about people. Many a time, I was moved, very moved, by their individual stories, their hopes and fears for the future, the memories of the troubles never far away. It also struck me that, for most people I spoke with, the fact that both Ireland and the UK were members of the EU was very, very important in ensuring stability on the island of Ireland. And that we needed to do everything in our power, everything, to make sure that the UK's decision to leave the EU did not jeopardize the stability in any way. Finding common ground with the UK on how to achieve the goals was, as you know, perfectly not easy.
and sometimes very, very difficult. We went back to the drawing board many times to find a solution that would reconcile the many different interests at play. First with Prime Minister Theresa May and then with Boris Johnson. It was a collaborative effort. We spoke regularly with Ireland successive Tichig and Dakeni, Leo Varadkar and today uh, Mirol Martin with Minister Simon Coveney and with all the other members of the governments. And I am grateful, very grateful, that I was always able to count on their support. We exchanged views with the Dole and uh, uh, Chaned, as mentioned by uh, Mirol a few minutes ago, as well as with the Irish members of the European Parliament. We worked closely with Ireland's successive commissioners, my friends Phil Hogan and now Mary Marguinness. And ultimately, together, we found solutions thanks to these two uh, successive treaties, the first one on the withdrawal agreement, including the Irish protocol, and finally, a few days ago, the second one about the future relations. Together, we found solutions to ensure the respect of the Good Friday Agreement in all its dimensions, all its dimensions, thereby protecting the gains of the peace process, which people like David Trimble, John Hume, Samus Mannon, Martin McInnes, or and Jan Pesley worked so hard, so hard for with the support, of course, of successive Irish and British governments and of the EU. And finally, as we saw recently, very recently, all so many friends in the United States and first of all, the new president of the US, uh, Joe Biden. We found solutions with the withdrawal agreement and the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland and safeguard the whole island economy, while also protecting uh, the EU single market. And finally, we found solutions with the new trade and cooperation agreements a few days ago to secure a deep and ambitious framework for continued and lasting cooperation with the UK in a very broad range of areas going well beyond trade and including transport, energy, the fight against climate change and social security coordination. And of course, fisheries, where we fought hard for stability and predictability. But I know, to be frank, that this remains difficult for fishing communities, including in Ireland and the EU will continue to show solidarity. Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, award that I have the honor of receiving today testifies to this point achievement, this joint achievement, an achievement that is not only that of the Commission, but that of every member state, the 27 member states united, that stood alongside Ireland and Northern Ireland, and of every member of the European Parliament or of the national parliaments. An achievement of every civil servant, think tanker, academic and stakeholders that each in their own way, their own way, contributed constructively to the debate and to finding concrete and workable solutions to the complex Brexit puzzle over the past four and a half years. But first of all, I would like to dedicate this award, if I may, to each and every member of the exceptional teams that I have had the privilege of leading during the last four and a half years. With their commitment, with their perseverance, their tenacity, we would not be where we are today. Ladies and gentlemen, the vote I cast back in 1972 
was not just a vote in a referendum. It was a choice for Europe, a choice I have never regretted, never. The choice of pooling our markets and our resources, thereby creating more and better jobs and growth. The choice of joining force to better tackle our most pressing challenges, the pandemic, the climate change, migration, financial stability or security. The choice of enlarging our horizons or, and expanding our opportunities thanks to our freedom to work, study, travel or live in another EU member state. The choice of standing together in a world of ever-changing geopolitical realities. Standing alone is not standing strong. We do this each day thanks to our single market, thanks to our common policies, our rules and standards. And over the decades, our unity has turned Europe into a global trading power. It has strengthened our voice on the global stage. It has enabled us to promote our shared interest and our shared value. In a world where even the biggest of our member states look increasingly smaller as new economic powerhouses emerge. And ladies and gentlemen, in this new world, the capacity of our nations to shape global developments, the ability to set their own rules and standards, their sovereignty is being challenged. The European Union helps to reverse this trend by pulling, uh, not merging, pulling our sovereignty where it matters most. This is why I continue to believe that we have to be both patriotic and European, patriot and European, Irish and European, French and European. The two go together, lies these two flags behind me today. That is why, that is why presenting, preserving EU unity was so important throughout the Brexit process. And we succeed together. The unity and solidarity between member states was visible at every, every step of our negotiations with the UK. Contrary to what many predicted at the time of the 2016 Brexit referendum, Brexit did not trigger the end of the European Union, but the strengthening of its unity. Today, today, Brexit has exposed the consequences of leaving the EU for all to see. As we have always said, always said during these four and a half years, even though we have a deal, the UK's choices mean that we will be inevitable short-term and long-term consequences. Everyone needs to adapt to this new situation. Today, people are more aware of the benefits of the EU membership, even if too many citizens still continue to doubt the value of Europe or the ways in which it works. It is this last point that we must now work on it if we were really to learn the lesson uh, of Brexit, not only to tackle the consequences of the Brexit as we try to do with these two treaties, but also to learn the lessons of Brexit. And there is some lesson to draw. We need to show that Europe works for its citizens, that work, Europe has an added value for each and every citizen. We need to better understand the reasons of social anger in some regions of Europe and show that we are working to provi provide real workable solutions. This is a sense of the initiatives taken by the European Commission and uh, our president, Ursula von der Leyen, to combat the health crisis, nothing more important right now, to deepen our single market, which is much more than a free trade era, which is a, a, 
uh, an ecosystem, a real ecosystem, and bring it squarely into the digital age to help fuel Europe's economic recovery with the historic 750 billion euro next generation EU program and to create new, fairer opportunities for all Europeans. To launch a European Green Deal, putting the EU on the path to climate neutrality by 2050, while ensuring that no one is left behind in this generational transition. All these bold policy choices, among many others, will only bear fruit if we move forward together. With the European Parliament, with all member states and all European citizens as one union. For this, we need to continue building trust. This is in turn requires transparency and public debate, democratic debate, not just in capitals, but also in smaller towns, in the rural areas, not only through interaction with the EU officials, but also through dialogue with local, regional, and national politicians who all have a responsibility to engage more meaningfully on European issues. Ladies and gentlemen, why should we leave the EU debate to anti-EU parties? Why? Why should we only have such debates once every five years on the occasion of the election of the European Parliament? Why? For all those who believe in the EU project, this is not the time to sit back and to be complacent. We need to support organizations like your organization, the European Movement Island, which act as a bridge between the EU, the member states, and the citizens. Dear friends, the 21st century will inevitably continue to bring more existential global challenges, inevitably. The European Union can never be the answer to all problems, but by working together at all levels, we can make sure that Europe is up to the task of today's world, and perhaps more importantly, up to the expectations of future generations. Together, we can build a Europe that not only protects, but also inspires. A Europe that Europeans would never dream of leaving behind. A Europe that continues to make us stronger together. Niniart Gecker Lekela. This is, there is no strength without unity. There is no strength without, without unity. So thank you very much to all of you for this award. Thank you very much for your attention. Gurev Milama Agwev. Thank you very much, Michel, for that outstanding address. And indeed, I was actually very struck by the connection um, of your first vote in 1972 being the vote that you cast on the French referendum on the accession of Denmark, Ireland and the UK to the then EEC. Convinced, as you say, that the European project would be stronger when we are together. And as we present you with our European of the Year Award, it would be remiss of me not to also extend all of our thanks, our appreciation, and pay justifiable tribute to all of your team, Michel, for all of the fantastic work that all members of the task force, past and present, have served and have done on all of our behalfs over the last four and a half difficult years of Brexit and the negotiations, and whom we have been fortunate to have as our European negotiators. So I would like to thank and pay tribute and congratulate them as well today. Now, moving on to the questions, ladies and gentlemen, um, suffice it to say, we are getting a huge number of questions, Michel, which is great tribute to yourself and not least, we're delighted that our European Movement Ireland's European of the Year Award is your first public address, I think, since, since the deal before Christmas. So we'll start off with some uh, questions that have come in from some of our journalists. 
Uh, the first one is from Ken Murray, editor of EC Radio Ireland. And Ken is asking Michelle as to whether you would have any concerns following on from Brexit as to whether other member states may opt to leave the EU. I know this question arises. What do you think of that? Uh, to be frank, uh, uh, Noel, I have no longer this uh, feeling that uh, another member state uh, would have the temptation to leave, but uh, we have to be uh, vigilant. We have uh, to be vigilant because uh, it is always a risk for the future and uh, uh, this risk can be fight, combat by the, the proof that it is uh, clearly uh, a better situation to be inside the EU than outside. Uh, we never worked during this negotiation with any spirit of revenge or punishment, never just to work on the facts. And the facts today are clear. Uh, it's better to be in than out. Uh, but as I mentioned in my speech, and this point is very important for me, uh, we have to draw the lessons of the Brexit and to understand why 52% of the British people vote against Europe. There are reasons and we have to uh, listen we have to understand and we have to answer. It's obviously too late for the UK, but it's not too late for uh, the member states today. And uh, because in many regions, there are this anger, this, this, the same feeling against Europe or the same uh, problem to understand what we are doing at the European level. So we have to, to be careful, to be, to be vigilant and to be proactive to draw the lessons. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, couldn't agree more with you, Michelle, and, and that is something that we in European Movement Ireland will continue to do, and we look forward to collaborating with you, with colleagues, with the Commission in that regard. Um, our next question is from Sarah Collins uh, uh, with the Irish Independent, and Sarah has asked that since the agreement came into effect on the 1st of January, it has been widely reported that Northern Ireland hauliers and retailers are reporting shortages and difficulties in terms of GB goods and some difficulties around the customs. If, the, if these problems were to continue, would the EU be willing to invoke any emergency measures such as the Protocols Article 16 Safeguard Clause or any other derogation from EU rules? The point is not about uh, any kind of derogations for the vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the, the EU rules. We have to implement carefully, precisely, objectively these two treaties. Uh, first of all, the withdrawal agreement and the Irish protocol, and uh, uh, secondly, number two, the, the new pro the new treaty. But uh, let me be frank um, and repeat what I said uh, more or less every day during the last four and a half years. Um, it cannot Brexit it means Brexit. It cannot be business as usual for nobody. It cannot be break, uh, business as usual. And neither, uh, neither uh, in Northern Ireland or Ireland, uh, nor in any other EU member states, uh, it, it, it can be today business as usual. Uh, uh, we we have to tackle this this. Uh, uh, these consequences. I, I know and I carefully follow the situation in Northern Ireland for the, the all years for retailers. I know the difficulty for the fishermen. So we look at this difficulty very carefully with objectivity to find a way to, to, to address these difficulties. But um, for, for the last four years, I always and very often explain that uh, we have to be prepared to the changes. The change are linked mechanically, automatically to the Brexit and the fact that the UK uh, decided uh, unilaterally to leave the Union, the single market and the custom union. So that, that means many, many, many changes and many difficulties. But uh, we, will, we will continue to follow this difficulty to try to help. And in any case, the, the EU will remain uh, 
uh, in the same spirit of solidarity with the with Ireland and Northern Ireland. Absolutely, Michel. Um, our next question uh, for you comes from Shona Murray from Euronews. And Shona is wondering um, in her question, the UK is refusing to give the EU full diplomatic status. What is your reaction and what will be the repercussions for both sides? Uh, we will see what, what will be the final decision of the UK on this point, but they have, they have to be very careful. Huh? Uh, I, I know that, uh, once again, it cannot be business as usual. Uh, I know the, 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 the spin, uh, and sometimes more than the spin of the UK authorities speaking about EU uh, like uh, international organizations, but uh, uh, we are not an international organization like the others. We are the union, and the UK uh, took part of this union for uh, more or less uh, uh, 47 or 48 years. So uh, I hope that uh, we will be able together to find a clever and uh, objective solution to the statue of the EU in London. And I hope it will be, it will be, I think it will, it would be wise in my view to, for the UK to find a clever solution. And our next question, Michel, comes from Simon Carswell of the Irish Times. And he is asking that businesses have reported major challenges moving goods from Britain. Are there any means, as you see it, Mr. Barnier, to ease uh, border control measures? And are the rules of origin regulations an unforeseen consequence of the agreement? But once again, uh, let me be once again frank. Brexit means Brexit. Uh, that means that the, uh, the UK decided to be linked, no longer linked by the EU rules, by the standards, uh, the, uh, the supervision, the regulations, the, the ju jurisdictions, the Court of Justice of the EU. And uh, this situation has obviously and mechanically consequences. But in any case, that means also that each and every product entering in the EU, uh, in the single market, in Ireland, and uh, as well as everywhere else, must respect the standards and the rules that we implement inside the EU for the protection of the consumers, the security, the food security, uh, about uh, animals and, and vegetables, uh, the, the, to protect our budget also, and to protect the, the, the businesses, uh, by, for instance, against counterfeiting. So, so in any case, any goods entering in the EU must respect the rules. And among the rules, it is my direct answer to these questions, there is clearly for each and every goods entering or exported to the EU to respect what we call the rule of origin, which is for each and every good, the fact that a part of this good coming inside the EU, uh, thanks to this uh, treaty, must respect a proportion of good and uh, uh, pieces coming from uh, both sides and not from the outside the, the, the other part of the world. Uh, so so uh, it is the rules and it is a consequence of the Brexit. I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to repeat and to recall that uh, Brexit has consequences, in particular for the application, the implementation of this uh, uh, framework of rule of origin, which is also here to protect the jobs inside the EU, uh, in Ireland and every, everywhere else. Absolutely. And uh, four and a half years later, Brexit still means Brexit, I think, is, is the takeaway from that, Michel. Our next question for you is from Aidan Corkery, a correspondent with the Sunday Business Post. And Aidan is wondering that when the Brexit negotiations were at their most intense, um, I'd be interested in when they were from your perspective, he is wondering how often used you be in contact with Minister Simon Coveney and or with the Taoiseach here in Ireland? And what were those conversations like for you? But every day, every day, 
<laughs> my, my, my door, my phone, uh, where uh, has been open and, and uh, available every day, and I have been available every day for any contact with the T-Shock, the two T-Shocks I work closely, uh, Leo uh, and my, Miro, and also uh, with Simon on a daily basis, to be frank, and in particular in the, next, in the last very few weeks and days of the negotiation, I remember clearly that Simon spoke with me uh, uh, two, two or three times per week uh, about the different species and the, the stocks of, of fish and uh, uh, with a lot of competence also. Uh, it's uh, not uh, always the case that a foreign minister is so competent and involved in, in, in fishery issue. Huh? Uh, <laughs> so, so no, it was very, to, to be frank, this dialogue was very, uh, very, very useful and uh, even necessary in the last few weeks of the negotiation. But before, in the previous negotiation for the withdrawal agreement, uh, because this agreement is much more focused on the Irish issue and the, the peace and stability in Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland, uh, we, we had with uh, the, the Taoiseach and the government of Ireland uh, uh, a permanent, a permanent, uh, a permanent uh, dialogue. And it was very important also for another reason, uh, because uh, uh, as many people mentioned this, this unity of the 27. To be frank, this unity is, is not given by chance. It's not uh, falling from the, the sky. We have built this unity every day. And this unity was key in particular, has been key in particular uh, on the side of Ireland. The 26 other member states, from the day one until the last day, remain united and solidaire from Ireland. And this, this solidarity has been built and maintained thanks to the, the, the Taoiseachs and the, the, in the European Council and in many other occasions uh, speaking with the other member states. So once again, the unity is not given by chance, is built on transparency, dialogue, and in particular, the availability of the uh, Irish leaders to speak with their colleagues. And and Ninyart Kukurlikela again, Michelle, on that. And, and following on from that question, actually, in a, in a somewhat similar vein, Gronin Hay from the journal um, is asking you that Irish interests were at the heart of the Brexit negotiations from the start. How did that come about? How did it manage to stay that way, particularly during tense times over the protocol and when pressure was being put on EU capitals to abandon the backstop? Um, as you remember, the negotiation of the uh, Northern Ireland and uh, Ireland uh, peace process and uh, uh, the, the, the protection in all its dimensions of the uh, Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Agreement also, uh, uh, was a very difficult point during several months. We tried to reach a, a compromise and with Theresa May. You remember, uh, and three times she, she tried in, on her side to, to get the, the support of the House of Commons. Unfortunately, she did not succeed, and she left the, the, the 10 Downing Street for domestic reasons. I don't want to comment. And Boy Johnson came uh, as a prime minister and uh, immediately told us that he don't want to accept, in any case, this protocol. Remember, his last protocol uh, with Theresa May uh, as planned to include for temporary time the totality of the UK in uh, our custom union to facilitate uh, the situation in Ireland. Uh, he refused clearly this part of the treaty and we work again uh, with him to find solutions, as I said in my speech. Uh, uh, what, what creates problem in Ireland is the Brexit during this time. Nothing more, nothing, nothing else. Uh, and uh, we tried to find solutions, concrete operational solutions for any problem created by the Brexit. And finally, we find this solution with uh, this inclusion of the territory of Northern Ireland in our uh, uh, um, uh, single market area, uh, respecting the uh, integrity of the uh, custom territory of the UK. Uh, we have always respected the integrity of the UK and the sovereignty of the UK and, and the 
inter internal order of the UK, but we found together with Boris Johnson a solution. And what we did in the last few months of the last year with Maroslav Kovic and our team is to uh, go into details for the right implementation of the Irish protocol at the border to find solutions. It is a, I, I recognize it is a complex uh, protocol to implement, but it is also to face a complex situation uh, and square the circle huh, of uh, no border on uh, land of Ireland, uh, protecting of the single market, all island economy, uh, and uh, the, the peace process. So, so we, we try to, to find a solution for every and each problem created by the Brexit. And I think that now, uh, if we are responsible and if we work in good faith, we, we, we can work uh, um, in, the, in the long and, and the medium and long term on the base of this protocol for the, for the progress of Northern Ireland and for the progress of the island of Ireland. And our next question for you, Michelle, comes in from Naomi O'Leary of the Irish Times. And she is wondering that what is your impression of the UK's plans to diverge? And what impact will this have on relations and ease of trade with the EU? Hmm. Um, we are not surprised because we are not naive. Uh, and in the last few days, I listened carefully what, uh, what were the, the speeches of some ministers and uh, uh, stakeholders in UK uh, on uh, the uh, work, the workers' condition, the, the duration of the the, 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 the workers, the the, 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 the time, the, the time for the, the work and the, the duration of the weeks of work for the pesticides. Uh, and also for the financial services. Uh, once again, we are not surprised, but we'll see. The point for us is to know and to look carefully if uh, there is a risk or not that this uh, new autonomy of the UK vis-a-vis -vis the EU rules, and the Brexit is about to regain this autonomy, this sovereignty, this legislative and regulatory autonomy, if this new autonomy for the UK be come or not in the future a tool for dumping against us. It is the, 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 the fact and the point. Uh, I don't want to say before what will happen perhaps after, but we will see carefully and we are not ready to accept any kind of dumping against us. In that case, we will use the tools included in the treaty. Michelle, um, I'm going to ask you a, a, a question myself um, that it struck me as I watched the inauguration of uh, President Joe Biden yesterday and one line where he said, we will repair our alliances and engage with the world again. And as you, you, you might be aware here in Ireland, along with yourself being our, our, our favourite honorary Irishman, we also have a special affection for Joe Biden uh, as another honorary Irishman. Was the US, uh, did the US ever get involved in terms of the Brexit negotiations? Would you have had conversations with colleagues in the USA? How, how did the, the, the US involvement uh, take, take place? So I know that uh, for many reasons, uh, the Irish people and the Irish leaders had an affection, as you rightly said, to, for Joe Biden or for Kamala Harris also, but uh, in the other sense, you know that uh, Joe Biden has also a special affection for Ireland. Uh, and uh, he, he, he gave a clear proof of this affection by some tweets, which were, uh, I see, I think important at the stage of negotiation. Uh, obviously, I had many, many contacts with the US uh, administrations. I went uh, several times to explain uh, what was at stake uh, for the Brexit, how we manage the negotiation. I spoke several times with the uh, uh, US ambassador in, in Brussels. I have not yet uh, contacts or dialogue with the, the new administration. Uh, one day, or one day and a half. So, so uh, but I, I think it's a good thing that the, the new US administration uh, will follow carefully what happened in Ireland. And I hope, I, I'm 
I make a tweet yes I made a tweet yesterday after the, the inauguration of the new presidency uh, just to say my hope that uh, Joe Biden said it's a new day for uh, America yesterday obviously but it is also a new uh, a new start in my view for the relation between US and Europe and uh, we have so much to do together to face the global challenges so much to do together that we need to to rebuild these relations on a new base uh, without naivety uh, with uh, great lucidity but also with a mutual respect between the us and, and the eu and we are clearly in that spirit to work with joe biden and kamala Harris. absolutely as do we as do we um a great question from one of our members regina o'connor and she has said, uh, Michelle, as you have hiked and walked a long and complex path, is it true that dark comes before the dawn? And how did you break through the dark when it was most difficult in terms of the Brexit negotiations? And what lessons and learnings can you share? Uh, once again, the, the, the negotiation has been uh, long, very long, but to be frank, not so long if you make a, some benchmarking with some other negotiation for trade, for instance, with Canada. It took uh, five years and a half just for a free trade agreement, uh, more or less the same time with Japan or Korea. And what we have done uh, with this new treaty on, on the new relation with the UK is much more than a, a free trade agreement. I clear, clearly said in my uh, introductory remarks that we have a, now a partnership not only on trade with the level playing field, but also on fishery, uh, energy, uh, road transport, aviation, internal security for citizens. Unfortunately, the UK refused in the past, uh, last year, to negotiate on uh, external policy, defense, cooperation in Africa, uh, or uh, uh, foreign policy, but I hope it will be possible to build a, uh, a new trend of negotiation on this specific issue, which is important for the global stability of the, the continent. Uh, it has been long, but not so long. Uh, it has been uh, sometimes difficult because uh, many things were, were linked with the domestic situation in the UK, the domestic debate, and more precisely, Many things were linked with the internal debate in the Tory party. So it was not so easy to, to follow. I tried to understand, to listen, never intervene in the domestic debate, but always listening and understanding what happened. And uh, we have decided to be frank, uh, to be never impressed. And we have been never impressed by any pressures, uh, pressures, uh, campaign, or uh, spin uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in some press of the UK. Uh, we have follow our line, which was, has been always the same, to defend the EU interest for citizens, consumers, and businesses, to defend our values, and to defend the integrity of the single market. So all along these four years and a half, I always, every day, follow the same line. No emotion, no passion. The fact, the legal base, the EU interests, uh, and it was uh, all what we did. And it is the reason why we always keep calm and respectful for the UK. I always respect the person uh, across the, 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 the table, huh? always. I, as you remember, I had four minister and negotiator in FSME during these last four years, one per year, but uh, I always respect these persons. And actually on, on that point, Michelle, very interesting, uh, if we may, what was the dynamic like uh, with the British negotiators? You and your colleagues obviously spent a lot of time in their company in, 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 in deep negotiations with the British teams over the years. Did, I wonder, did, did friendships develop? Are you going to keep, keep in touch? Uh, let me recall that uh, a part of the last negotiation during the 
2021 was impacted severely, severely impacted by the COVID uh, crisis. And so, uh, not only personally, because we we, we had uh, David Frost, uh, Boris Johnson, and myself, we are we were touched by the uh, the virus. But uh, but uh, more than our personal case, uh, the negotiation has been impacted. And during three three months, we worked only by uh, visio conference and not in person. So it was a, a, a clear problem to which we did not did not facilitate the negotiations. But uh, uh, yes, we have created uh, with these uh, four teams and four negotiator personal and cordial relations. And I am ready to keep in contact. For instance, I receive a, a personal uh, SMS message from David Davis after the last deal, and I'm ready to, and I will, I'm willing to, to keep contact because I, I, I will remain a politician in my country, uh, a European politician also, and I, I think in any case, we had to, uh, on the base of this treaty uh, and the future relationship for foreign policy, to to keep close relation with the UK, because in any case, the UK will will remain our neighbor, our ally, our friends, our partner. So we have to, to, to keep in touch. And I am ready to keep in touch. So there may still be Brexit negotiators, reunions at some stage in the future. Not, 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 not exactly the same, fortunately. <laughs> course. Um, and Michelle, just one question as well that I'd perhaps like to ask. We've only seen this week uh, that you have become an advisor to President of the European Commission, uh, von der Leyen. And in terms of the next chapter in your career, what is next? Are you going to return to France? You mentioned that you're going to remain a, p a politician, a European politician. What's the next chapter in Michel Barnier's career? It is a a personal question, but let, let me answer frankly. First of all, on the, on the point I, what I have to do in the next few weeks, uh, thanks to the President Ursula von der Leyen, she, she asked me to, to remain for a few weeks, only a few weeks, perhaps February, beginning of March, to uh, follow and to support the process of ratification of the treaty uh, under the European Parliament. Don't forget that the European Parliament had not the time before Christmas to ratify, to examine this text. So they need times, perhaps two months, to be able to ratify. And I'm, I'm ready to, to, to stay uh, in Brussels on the side of the president to, uh, to help uh, as, as, um, as far as I can, as can, can do this process of ratification to the European Parliament. So after I will leave, uh, because it's, uh, it's over, the, and I will come back in my country. I, I've, to be frank, I've never been a super technocrat in Brussels, uh, despite some uh, uh, caricature. Huh? Uh, I've always been a politician, involved, elected man, and I will come back in my country to, to, to be useful. I don't know yet how and uh, with who. Uh, it's uh, the, the time of a collective work in France. Uh, my, my country needs all the energies and I'm ready to, to, to be useful and to, and to, to, to give my energy to my country. Uh, we will see how and with who, but uh, there is so many to do and so much to do, uh, even in France. Huh? Of course. As we say in Ireland, Michel, watch this space. Uh, yes, let me just add one point on, about my, my country, because I spoke in my speech about the, the lessons and once again, we have to be careful and to draw the lessons of Brexit. Uh, it's not the past. It's the clearly uh, the present situation we have to face uh, in many countries to avoid that uh, popular sentiment, this uh, social anger, uh, uh, to address this, this uh, social anger uh, and not confuse this social anger, this popular sentiment with the populism. It's not the same things. Uh, um, the, the populism, the, the, the populist party, used this uh, uh, popular sentiment. But we have to address this uh, anger and this uh, uh, popular. But there is, there is some, sometimes uh, uh, some similitude or uh, some uh, uh, something which seems to be the same in UK and France about Europe. And my goal has been always as a patriot, Gaullist and European, to to, to be careful and to, to be in, in the same time patriot and, uh, and European and also 
to take care that uh, uh, coming back to France and taking once again part of the public debate in my country, uh, I, I want France remain European, uh, not that Europe became French, uh, to be frank. So, so it is my, my goal. Huh? And so say all of us. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michel, for giving so generously um, of your time. And um, on, on that regard, you'll be pleased to know that European of the Year is trending on social media. So you are, you are trending, Michel, uh, on, on social media, and we're delighted uh, with, with that. And thank you so much for your time. Um, and I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, well, that unfortunately... Sorry that we were, we were uh, only able to speak thanks to this camera and this uh, video conference to other people listening and following this debate. And thank you to all of you once again. Thank you for this uh, very, very impressive and uh, beautiful award. And uh, I hope uh, as soon as possible, thanks to the sanitary situation, to, to be able to come back to Ireland. Because uh, as I told you, because it's clearly the truth, uh, I, I feel much more than a, a bit, but um, I feel Irish in many, many sense. Personally, I hope to be able to to answer to Simon and to go fishing with him. And I hope also, as the Taoiseach said, to be able to the very, very uh, uh, old uh, dream for me and project to, to, to spend a few times where the General de Gaulle spent the last part of his life in Ireland. For many reasons, personal reasons also. Thank you very much. Yes, and un grand merci, Michel. And we will certainly work very hard to make all of that uh, possible. It has been our pleasure and our honour to present to you as our very deserving European Movement Ireland European of the Year. And hopefully, hopefully, in that not too distant future, we will have the opportunity to raise a glass in your honour, to toast you here in person, and to toast you as our European of the Year awardee when you have the opportunity to visit us in Ireland. You are an honorary Irish person and you always will be. And if I may, I would also like to extend our thanks to all of your team for their help, their support and assistance in terms of making today's wonderful celebration possible. Particularly, I would like to thank Dan Ferry, Mila Boykistan. Thank you also to the Taoiseach, Michal Martin, to Minister Simon Coveney and to Minister Thomas Byrne for their contributions. Thank you to their teams in the Department of Foreign Affairs, in the Department of the Taoiseach and colleagues in the Perm Rep in Brussels. And a big thank you to our Chairman, Maurice Pratt, our Vice Chair, Gillian Van Turnout, and all the European Movement Ireland Board and the European of the Year Award Judging Committee for their ongoing dedication, their commitment and their engagement. We are fortunate to have such a hardworking board and indeed European Movement Ireland is fortunate to have such supporters that help drive forward this movement. As a membership organisation, we are grateful for all of our members' support over the last 67 years. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you'd like to help support our work for the next 67. All our information is across our website, europeanmovement.ie and all social media platforms. Today's event has been very long in the making over the last number of years. In fact, when we first communicated to Mr. Michel Barnier that he was our European of the Year. And alas, the vagaries of the Brexit negotiations at various times necessitated this award ceremony changing date on multiple occasions. But we got there in the end. We have arrived today to celebrate our European of the Year awardee. And to that end, on my own behalf, I want to extend my thanks and give credit to the brilliant European Movement Ireland team who have worked tirelessly to bring today's award event to fruition. And finally, but by no means least, a big thank you to those of you watching online, ladies and gentlemen. It has been our best ever attended event in these very challenging circumstances. And until we meet again, and hopefully it won't be too long, please do stay safe, stay well. Míle buíchas as a veling don ócaad speciál de Sáinniúv. Sláin go fól, goodbye and take care.
An idea is only as strong as the people who share it. Throughout its history, the European Union, the ideal of Europeans living and working together in peace and prosperity, has been advanced by remarkable people who gave more than was expected. Founded as the Irish Council of the European Movement in the Shelburne Hotel in January 1954, the European Movement Ireland is an independent, not-for-profit, membership-based organisation working to develop the connection between Ireland and Europe. Since 1988, when Peter Sutherland was named our inaugural European of the Year, the award, our highest honour, has recognised those who have made outstanding contribution to promoting and enhancing Ireland's place in the EU. The title of European of the Year has been awarded to a distinguished list of Irish individuals with backgrounds in art, business, politics and administration. These include former Tishi, members of the Irish Defence Forces, the playwright Brian Friel, former Secretary General of the European Commission, Catherine Day, and the late John Hume. Our founders believed in recognising the role of people in shaping a better future for the European Union and Ireland's place within it. Today, we believe that more than ever. Michel Barnier took the time and energy to understand Ireland, our unique position, our history, our relationship with the EU. He has gained the trust and respect of the Irish people. He is our European of the Year.